catching more fish than them inside my own house. Oh! Yes. Hey guys, loud guys. Today we are going to watch America obliterates half North Vietnam's MiG-21 fleet in 13 minutes. So that is a big thing. And the thing is, like, uh, America did all of this in 13 minutes, and he will explain us in 30 minutes. 30 minutes, yes. <laughs> so, he is taking more time than America took uh, to obliterate them. Huh. But, yes, of course, because he has to explain each and everything. So, it will be very fun to watch. And this operation name is Operation Bolo. Bolo. So, Bolo in Hindi means, like, to speak, to say something, yes. So, this is very interesting, like, Operation Bolo. So, Bolo. let's see. What is going to happen in this operation? So let's watch this video. Ah, uh, yes, a time during the Vietnam War where the United States Air Force finally agreed to let a double fighter ace pilot from World War II run the show. He then immediately saw to the destruction of over half of North Vietnam's state-of-the-art fighter jets, and he did it in 13 minutes. Oh, wow. Today we're talking about Operation Bolo, one of the greatest ruses in military history. But first, a word from our sponsor. Oh. Oh! When I told you to get a hobby, this isn't what I meant. You said I could pick up fishing. Not like this. <laughs> why? Get out of my hair! I don't know why she's mad. This is way better than real fishing. Fishing Clash lets you catch way more fish than you ever could in real life from locations all across the world from the comfort of your own home. Not only that, the game's completely customizable, allowing you to unlock and upgrade all of your equipment and even building your own fishing village. They also have daily and weekly events allowing you to compete against other people. You can also join a clan and play with your friends. They also just partnered with Major League Fishing to sponsor the Angler of the Year Awards. So if you guys want to give it a try, there's a we can also play this game. There's a link and a gift card down below. When you use my gift card, Fat Fish, you're going to get $20 worth the free equipment and power-ups as well as a one-of-a-kind avatar. Now I'm gonna get back to fishing. Oh, 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 what happened? He's never gonna get out of his house. We're never gonna have a minute by ourselves <laughs> unless he leaves that room. I know how to get him out of this house. How? Oh. Finally some peace and quiet. Everybody else is freezing their ass off in their ice fishing huts and I'm catching more fish than them inside my own house. Oh! Yes? What's your uh, discount code for that little game? Fat fish, why? Because I've decided to join you. Aww. Yeah, I had to go mow the lawn. What? Oh, oh yes, of but course. It's winter out. No. Oh. Let's see this little game. Oh, this is better. <laughs> this is very better. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Release. We want her to narrate the whole Alright, so Operation Bolo <laughs> takes place within another mission known as Operation Rolling Thunder, and Operation Rolling Thunder spans from March of 1965 until November of 1968. It is essentially the air war over North Vietnam, so super brief, oversimplified version of what's going on. The American forces are in South Vietnam, and they are fighting the VC, or the Viet Cong, which is a guerrilla fighting force. And that guerrilla fighting force America is lost the war. from the North Vietnamese via the Ho Chi Minh Trail, so America needs to try to shut down those supply lines. Logic being, if the enemy doesn't have supplies to fight, the enemy can't fight. Real base level War 101 Sun Tzu type stuff, right? Okay, well, America pretty much has two options. They can A, invade North Vietnam with ground forces, or they can B, just attempt to bomb the holy fuck out of them. Okay. And America's going with option B, and B, that's what of Operation course. Rolling Thunder is. It is just a human blow everything up. long air bombing campaign where America is going to try to blow up so much North Vietnamese infrastructure that they can't continue to support the Viet Cong. Which, honestly, it's a really good plan. What's the problem? The enemy's got nice things? Oh, well, take the nice things away. Send the planes in, bomb the roads, bomb the railroad tracks, and make it so they can't give the enemy a bunch of supplies. It's it's good. It should work. And then the politicians got involved. And let's face it, if anybody could mess up something so simple, it's going to be a politician because, well, honestly, they could probably fuck up boiling water. So how on earth did they mess it up? Well, they gave the American military a bunch of rules of engagement, which is a fancy way of saying they gave the American military a bunch of rules that only they have to follow and the enemy doesn't, essentially mm. tying the U.S. military's hands behind its back and then sending them into battle anyways. And one of these oh. rules of engagement or one of these protocols that they had to abide by was that every plane that went into North Vietnam to bomb them had to travel through a particular air corridor and that is oh. the only route they were allowed to take Why? to North Vietnam. Meaning that pretty much immediately the North Vietnamese Everybody picked up would a pattern know. that every single plane that flies into their country follows a particular path and they then proceeded to take all of their surface to air missiles, all of their radars, of all of course. their anti-aircraft capabilities in the entire country and put them in this one particular spot. And then the U.S. government decided to keep making their guys fly right through it anyways oh. the entire oh. time. Now at this point you're probably thinking, oh my god, the politicians might actually secretly be 
geniuses because what they've done is they have inadvertently gotten the North Vietnamese to gather all of their anti-aircraft resources into one location. And now we can just bomb those, take them out, and they'll have nothing left and it'll just be green light go everywhere. So now the US military is like, yo, politicians, can I blow that shit up now because it's right there just waiting for me? To which the politicians are like, absolutely not. In Why? Fact, we're gonna make it a rule that you're not allowed to bomb or attack any anti-aircraft sites, any surface to air missile arrays, any anti-aircraft anything, you have to leave it completely unscathed. And our what? logic behind that is that at those sites, there could potentially be a Chinese or a Soviet advisor that's helping out the North Vietnamese. And if we hurt oh. one of them, it would upset the Soviets or the Chinese. And then that would be bad diplomatic. that is even their fault. they there to help run a proxy war against us. We're yeah. going to go ahead and care more logic. about them than we are about our own pilots. So we're going to go ahead and just have you guys keep flying through that same air channel, through all the anti-aircraft everything, because fuck you, that's why. This is bullshit! So that's exactly what happens. Every single time they fly a mission, every Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps plane has to fly through the same air corridor through a gauntlet of anti-aircraft capability on their way to deliver their payload. And then if that wasn't bad enough, the North Vietnamese got their hands on somewhere between 12 and 16 MiG-21s. And if you don't know, at this point in time, the MiG-21 is a new cutting-edge Soviet yeah. fighter jet. It is incredibly fast, it has a very high flight ceiling, and it is very very nimble. And using these MiG-21s, they very quickly develop a strategy that amounts to basically guerrilla warfare in the sky, utilizing a hit and run tactic. So their strategy is that they are gonna go specifically after the F-105 Thunder Chief, AKA the THUD. It is the number one plane that America is using in Operation Rolling Thunder and all of their bombing runs. And when it is weighed down with a bunch of bombs, it is basically a sitting duck for a MiG-21. So what ends up happening is every time a bunch of THUDs get sent out on a bombing run, they have to fly through that corridor of anti-aircraft capability and the arrays and everything else tells the enemy that it's a bunch of F-105s going on a bombing run. So they scramble the MiG-21s, they go up there, they intercept these F-105s, at which point one of two things can happen. The F-105s can continue on their bombing run and most likely get shot down by the MiG-21s, mm. or they can drop their payload just over the jungle randomly in the middle of nowhere, not on target, and then make an escape and live. And bear in mind, the North Vietnamese only have a couple of these fighter jets and they're fighting a war of attrition against a much larger industrial force like America. Yeah. So they are more than happy to send a plane up there, burn a little bit of fuel, get the Americans to drop tens or hundreds or millions of dollars worth of bombs on the middle of nothing, waste all their money, waste all their time, and then take their planes and land. They don't need to go out there and waste all their missiles and risk their planes. Yeah. They're just gonna get the Americans to waste all of their bombs on nothing. And I know what you're thinking, that seems like a pretty easy problem. What if we just bombed the MiGs while they were on the ground? Or what if we bombed the airfields that they were coming from? That way they couldn't even take off. Well, luckily we have politicians to step in and tell I us mean. once again, you're not allowed to bomb those either because there could potentially be an advisor from, from China, China or the Russia. USSR there. So leave those alone too. You're only you're only allowed to take out enemy planes when they're in the air. To which the U.S. military is like, okay, I, I guess we'll do the literally the only thing we can do. We'll just send up our fighter jet, the F-4 Phantom II, and try to go toe to toe with the mix. Okay, so the stage is set. We have one of the sexiest airplanes of all time, the American Whoa. F-4 Phantom II, going toe to toe with the Soviet oh, MiG-21. Wow. Okay, here's wow. what I need you to understand about this matchup. This is pretty much the golden era of of military planes, okay? In my opinion, it's right before stealth technology came out and planes started to get a little bit slower because they could be sneaky now. No, planes built during this period were just straight up, fast. let's be fast as fuck and carry a ton of firepower. It's the hot rod era of military planes. And both of these planes are built on that doctrine. The F-4 Phantom tops out at like 1400 miles an hour. Wow. The MiG-21 tops out at like 1300 miles an hour. The F-4 Phantom is like twice the size of the MiG-21. It's got a way bigger fuel tank. It's got way more range. It can carry a lot more payload. The MiG-21, on the other hand, it's a lot smaller, it's a lot lighter, it's nimbler, but it doesn't have as much range. So the MiG-21 in an up-close dogfight is probably going to be better with its gun, mm. whereas the F-4 Phantom, not really intended for up-close dogfighting, it doesn't even have a gun. Because it has a more advanced radar and missiles that can take the enemy out from 29 miles away, it doesn't even wow. need to see the enemy to shoot them out of the sky, so why on earth would it need a gun? Okay, the F-4 Phantom's MO is to haul ass, shoot half-court shots, and have a dope-ass paint job the entire time it does it. So, just so we're on the same page, Soviet MiG-21 and American F-4 very much peers to one another. They are both capable of taking the other out. They both pose a huge 
threat to one another. However, theoretically speaking, the MiG-21 should have an advantage in an up-close dogfight due mm. to its maneuverability and its gun, whereas the F-4 has the advantage because it can just shoot down the MiG-21 before it even gets close enough for a dogfight to occur. So, MiG-21, better up close, F-4, better Very far away. So that's it. That's the solution, right? The F-4 Both have their own advantages. They're going to shoot the MiGs down from like 20 miles away before the MiGs even know they're there, and that's going to be the end of it. Ta-da! Ta-da! Luckily for the North Vietnamese, the American politicians step in yet again with another exciting rule of engagement. Guess what? You're not allowed to shoot at enemy aircrafts until you have what? visual confirmation that it is an enemy aircraft. Uh, translation, the American F-4 pilots are American not politicians from Vietnam. The MiG-21s <laughs> until the MiG-21s have the advantage. Which is absolutely insane to think about. Like, literally the equivalent of walking up to an infantryman and being like, hey, Here's a sniper rifle. Also, you're not allowed to shoot people with it. You're only allowed to use the bayonet. Uh -huh. And there's no bayonet because we didn't design it with a bayonet lug because it's only designed to shoot people from really yes. far away. Get bent. And just in case that wasn't bad enough, what makes this even worse is the fact that most of the F-4 pilots are only trained on the American F-4, which wasn't really designed for up-close dogfighting yeah, with so a gun because it doesn't fights. have a gun. So most of them it's like don't tying really their hand behind. conduct an ah. up-close dogfight because they've never been trained to do it because that's not what their plane is supposed to fucking do. So there's really no good answer, and this goes on for a little while where basically the F-105s go up, the MiG-21s go up, intercept, the F-105s are then forced to drop all their bombs in the middle of nowhere and take off just so they can survive. The MiG-21s then go and land, and that just repeats itself at nausea. But then in September of 1966, something happened that would change everything because the 8th Fighter Wing out of Udong Thai Royal Air Force Base would get a new commander, and that commander was none other than the legendary fighter pilot, Colonel Robin Olds. And I mean, you can know nothing about this guy, and you he already know he's a main deadly. character. I mean, yeah. look at the lip sweater on this yeah. man. It's the most magnificent taco flosser I've ever seen in my entire Actually. life. Okay, let me break this down for you. Anytime you've ever seen a movie with the cool bad boy character that doesn't follow the rules, it's also a fighter yeah, pilot. Gun. It's based gun. off of this guy whether you know it or not. Okay, I want you to understand the gravity of the situation here. This man's mother passed away when he was four years old, and he was raised by a single father that oh. was also a full-time army pilot and a World War I veteran. Wow. This guy was essentially bred to be a fighter pilot. He went to West Point where he became an all-American football player at 6'2", 250 pounds. He then went on to become a fighter pilot in World War II. Now, if you shoot down five or more enemy planes, you become an ace pilot. It's Flying kind of ace. a really big deal. And Robin Olds was a double ace in <gasps> World War too. This man double is prestiged in the most extreme air-to-air -air combat the world has ever seen, and he's about to become a triple ace in Vietnam. And at Whoa. the age of 44, nonetheless, how's the old saying go, beware of an old man in a young man's game? Yeah, this is the main character for sure. And like most great main characters, Robin Olds has a lot of very high-ranking people that don't really like him that much, mostly because he's not afraid to ruffle a couple of feathers to get his point across. He and looks most recently, crazy. the argument that he's been having with the establishment is the fact that the F-4 Phantom, the main fighter jet for the United States military, should probably have a gun on it. He also has an issue with how these new pilots are being trained because they're not really being trained how to actually dogfight. They're just being trained how to haul ass, intercept a plane, and shoot a missile at it, as opposed to actually getting into a yeah. close quarters fight. And the chain command is basically telling Robin and old. It's like, hey, look, you're old. They don't do it like that anymore. You were fighting in World War II and P-51 Mustangs and P-38 Lightnings. This is not what's going on anymore. Oh, These kids that's are flying disrespectful. F-4 Phantoms that can fly at 1,400 miles an hour and shoot missiles and take out targets from 30 miles away. We don't need to teach them up-close dogfighting anymore because they're never actually going to use it because the technology eliminates the need for that. But you know what technology doesn't fix? Politicians being fucking stupid. So now, everybody has to fight like it's World War II in a dogfight because they're not allowed to use the technology the way they're supposed to because politicians that don't understand what they're talking about get That's to make up bad. the rules. So, now they're sending Robin Olds to go take over command of the 8th Fighter Wing. He shows up and immediately earns everybody's respect. Keyword, oh. earns it doesn't just get it given to him. And the way that he earns it is one of the best examples of leadership that I have ever read about. This man shows up to take command of an entire fighter wing as a double ace World War II pilot and a legend. And he decides to immediately put himself on the flight roster as a rookie to get trained on how to better use the F-4 wow. Phantom because he's not very well acquainted with it. And he lets all he's the men the best. that are lower than and him then he train him on this plane. He didn't come in all train. cocky. He wasn't some it's arrogant prick. Thing. He just admitted, no ego. hey, I've been doing this for a long time. Fantastic. I've flown a lot of planes. I'm not super great with the F-4 Phantom. I need to get great with it so I can lead you guys. And that's exactly what he did. And it immediately earned him all the 
respect in the world. Excellent. So Robin takes some time to get acquainted with the F4 Phantom, and within a couple of weeks, he's already flying the plane better than most of the trainers. So now that Robin Olds is caught up on the F4 Phantom to where all of his guys are, he is now going to teach these young whippersnappers how to dogfight like it's World War II. And this is like the cool moment from all the movies where old schools teach a new school how to get shit done anyways, okay? This is Rocky teaching Adonis Creed how to box. <laughs> this is Doc teaching Lightning McQueen that sometimes you got to turn right to go left. Oh. 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 <laughs> and while all of this is happening, Robin Olds, in another great display of leadership, realizes that there's not enough of him to go around and he needs backup. He needs another badass World War II era pilot to come over and help him get and these guys ready. Back? So Olds calls in a couple of favors, gets one of his longtime friends transferred over to the 8th Fighter Wing to help him run the show, and that friend is none other than the legendary pilot Daniel Chappie James oh. Jr., a.k.a. He the also Black looks Eagle. like... In the late 1930s, Black Eagle. early 1940s, uh, this man was a ass. civilian pilot at the Tuskegee Institute that was contracted Tuskegee. by the U.S. government to train U.S. pilots how to fly. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you this is the man that trained the famous Tuskegee Airmen from World War II oh. before eventually enlisting and becoming one himself in 1943. After enlisting, he became an officer, at which point he was deemed too valuable as a trainer, so that's what he did for the duration of World War II, continued to train an entire generation of fighter pilots, and never actually saw combat himself. Wow. Then, in Korea, he would fly over a hundred combat missions before working at the Pentagon, where he would end up meeting Robin Olds. After this, he goes on to become the first black man to become a four-star general in the United States military. Ooh, wow. This man is also a complete badass, so Uncle Sam is essentially playing Operation Bolo on co-op mode with two main characters on the field. So, Chappie shows up to the 8th Fighter Wing, is reunited with his old friend Robin Olds, they become this extremely effective chain of command, and they are absolutely loved by all of their subordinates. Hmm. Because of that, this leadership duo is given a nickname that is originally intended as a term of endearment, although by today's standards it's probably not very politically correct, and that nickname was Black Man and Robin. Now all this happens in like the span of three months, so December 1966, they're running Black combat Man operations, Robin. and Robin Olds finally gets an idea of how to stop these new badass MiG-21s. By this point, Robin Olds is completely caught on to the MiG-21's entire strategy. They have zero interest in actually fighting with the F-4s, which mm. is driving Robin Olds nuts because he's a World War II era fighter pilot, and That's he wants exactly to fight. the type of shit that he's into. These MiG-21 pilots, however, just want to go up there, use guerrilla warfare tactics where they just either hit the F-105s or don't hit the F-105s and just convince them to drop their payload prematurely and waste everybody's time and then take back off. The MiG-21s have zero interest in tangling with the F-4s, which Robin Olds interprets as, I need to force these MiG-21s to, to fight me. So how's he gonna do that? Well, here's his plan. The reason the MiG-21s can identify the F-105s so efficiently is because the F-105s have a jamming pod on them that basically disrupts and interferes with the surface-to-air missiles down below. It messes up their radar so that the F-105s aren't gonna get taken out by all the anti-aircraft stuff on the ground. Problem with that is, is that emits a frequency that the North Vietnamese can see. They then know that a bunch of F-105s are coming, so they scramble the MiGs. So Robin Wolf decides, hey, let's take those jamming pods, mount them to mine and all the guys' F-105s, fours and then we'll fly there like we're f-105s in a bombing formation mm. and the migs will come attack us and by the time they get close enough to realize that we're not f-105s ideally it's going to be too late yeah the legendary nice. world war ii double fighter aces just went to the chain of command and requested permission to execute the old wily e. coyote he was said no. costume to catch the roadrunner strategy now probably going to work but there are a bunch of problems with this idea biggest problem right out of the gate is this doesn't solve the issue with rules of engagement because remember you're not allowed to fire on the enemy until you have visual visual confirmation yeah. that it is your enemy, and by then, the MiG-21s have an edge in air-to-air -air combat. Okay, not a big deal, though, because Robin has a two-step plan for that as well. Okay, oh. step number one, he knows that they only have 12 to 16 MiG-21s, so he's just going to roll in with 28 uh. F-4s, okay? Just completely overwhelm them, Double. even if they do have an edge in air-to-air -air combat. Okay, step number two, which is quite frankly the big ask, he wants the entire U.S. military to shut down all air operations over Southeast Asia while he conducts oh. this operation. Why? He wants the Army, the the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps, none of them to have any birds in the sky whatsoever. And his reason for that is so that he can bypass the rules of engagement. You see, the only reason the politicians are enforcing that rule of engagement where you have to have visual confirmation before you fire so on that you don't plane hit your is own because plane. there's a ton of planes in the air over Southeast Asia at all times, and Vietnam is already super controversial over in America, mm. and the last thing the politicians want to have to deal with is headlines that an American plane shot down another American plane. Oh, yes. So they just made no, the rule you're it. not allowed to shoot at anything unless you can visually see 100% for certain that it is in fact an enemy. So if Robin can make sure sure that the only planes in the sky are his guys mm. and the enemy, he should be able to go bombs away the entire easy. time and not have to mm. worry about it. So obviously this is a massive request and the chain of command says yes. 
Yes. Yes. Son of a bitch. I don't know. Oh, okay, even so I don't know. Thing we got to figure out: How do we make sure that these Mig 21s don't slip away? Because they're so nimble and they're so fast, they could pull a tight maneuver and be back at base before we're going to be able to catch them. So. How are we going to prevent that? Yeah. As soon as the MiG-21s take off and get in the air, they're going to send half of the F-4s to haul last past the entire future battlefield, and they're just going to do hot laps around the enemy airfield, mm. making it so the enemy can't go to land without fighting through those F-4s first, which effectively is going to give the pilots of the MiG-21s two options. They can stand and fight the F-4s, retreat, retreat and fight the other F-4s, or they can retreat, have nowhere to land, and eventually run out of gas. And remember, the F-4s have a much larger gas tank, so they are definitely going to run out of gas first. Plan. So it's a perfect plan. There's just one small problem left. How are we going to know when the MiG-21s take off and leave the airfield? Because if we send the F-4s out too soon, then the MiG-21s won't take off at all, and then we can't bomb them on the ground, mm. and it defeats the entire purpose of the mission. Easy problem to solve. We're going to get two spy planes, the C-130B2, a.k.a. the Silver Dawn. Oh. At this point in time, it is a state-of-the-art electronic warfare spy plane, and it's going to be able to receive all the enemy radio transmissions, so they're going to be able to tell as soon as the enemy MiG-21s take off. And obviously, given the fact that that was such an easy problem to solve, bureaucracy is obviously going to step in and make it extremely difficult <laughs> because the U.S. military only has like 20 of these Silver Dawn spy planes, uh. and while they are technically the property of the United States Air Force, they are directly under the command of the NSA, the National Security Agency, and oh. they are super duper stingy about whoever gets to use these planes. Basically, Why? the NSA gets final say as to whether or not this plane gets to participate in this mission, and that means that they're going to have to go through some stupid bureaucratic process where they ask for permission, it gets run up the chain of command like 30 people deep, and then finally some bureaucrat has to take responsibility. They're not going to do that because they don't want to put their ass on the line, so it's probably just going to be a big fat no, you can't use this plane, even though it's probably going to make the whole mission work. Now this is normally the part of the story where the hero strategically transfers a piece of equipment to an alternate location so that he mm. can get the job done. However, he doesn't have to do that because what they do instead is decide to not tell the NSA uh -huh. anything. Oh, Mama don't know. Won't hurt her. And when I say they're not going to tell the NSA anything, I mean they are somehow going to keep it a secret from the NSA, the whole part of the story where the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, and the Army that ground every single bird that's not on this mission. They're going to somehow keep that a secret from the fucking spy agency uh. so that they go ahead and send up their two Silver Dawns doing hot laps around the Gulf of Tonkin that they have going around every single day. So that those two planes are in the air participating on this mission, whether the NSA knows knows it or not, and then as soon as the mission kicks off, they're going to radio over to them and just have them tell them whether or not the MiG-21 is nice. It's both genius and hilarious, because now, even if the NSA does find out after the fact and get all pissed off, all the Air Force chain of command has to do is be like, oh, you guys didn't get that memo? We sent it. At which point, they're basically going to be forced to just drop the issue, because none of them are going to want to take responsibility for not passing along the memo that never actually got sent. So that's mm. it. This mission gets approved. Operation Bolo is going to happen. So they hurry up. They get all the jamming pods off of F-105s. They mount them on the F-4s. And while that's going on, they schedule it with the entire U.S. military, all four branches, that nobody is to have planes in the air on January 2nd, 1967, yeah. except for the NSA, of course. Somebody forgot to tell them. So January 2nd rolls oh, around. No. Oh, so NSA planes were there. The F-4s are on the airstrip with the jamming pods mounted and they're ready to go. And it's fucking cloudy and overcast out, which is not good for this entire Cloudy. But also, fuck it. There's nothing they can do. They have to run this mission right now. They shut down the skies over all of Southeast Asia to get this shit done. It has to happen right now or it's never going to happen. But I mean, hey, it should all work out. I mean, even inside of the art of war, Sun Tzu once said, and I quote, you can plan a pretty picnic, but you can't predict the weather. Yeah. Actually. That's true. How did the lyrics to Miss Jackson get inside my son Zuba? <laughs> I, I guess I was Andre 3000. I apologize mm -hmm. a trillion times. Anyways, point stands. The mission goes. So the F-4s get put up in the air, and there's seven flights of F-4s. Each flight is four F-4s for a total of 28, and they are all named after cars. Flight one is named Olds, being Olds. led by Robin Olds. Flight two is Ford, Ford, led by Chappie. And flight three is Rambler, being led Rambler. by Captain John Stone. And everything they do follows exactly what the F-105s would normally do. They're taking the same route at the same elevation, using the same radio frequencies. They're even using bombs or call signs in case somehow their radio transmissions get intercepted and mm. they're emitting the same jamming frequencies as well using those pods. So sure enough, nice. the men show up and wouldn't you know it, the first guy to see one is none other than Robin Olds. He immediately splits his flight into two groups of two 
and oh. Olds and his wingman take off after this MiG. Olds fires two radar guided missiles and they both end up losing their lock and he misses entirely. He then closes the distance more so he can fire a heat seeking missile and oh. it's a dud. And then the MiG that oh, he's chasing no. goes into the clouds and he loses them entirely. And as soon as he loses sight of that MiG, another MiG is screaming past him going the opposite direction. So close that Olds can't just make a normal turn. Without batting an eye, Olds immediately hits a vector roll, which is a technique right out of the World War II dogfighting oh, handbook. Wow. It's essentially you nose up and you do a backflip corkscrew maneuver and end up behind your enemy. And as he's mid vector roll upside down pulling G's, he gets a radio transmission from Captain Johnson of Rambler Group saying, hey, I just got into the battlefield. Where are you? I heard that you're engaging an enemy. Olds finishes the vector roll, gets behind this MiG, radios back to stone, find your own, and then fires a missile and blows up the first MiG. Wow. The rest of the MiGs kind of figure out that the Americans have tricked them and they are now basically locked inside of the Thunderdome and they're going to have to fight their way out to have any chance at all. And the yeah. entire thing devolves into one enormous dogfight. And remember, the other four flights aren't there yet. They're lagging behind a couple of minutes. So we still just have the original three flights of Olds, Ford, and Rambler for a total nice. of 12 F4s going toe-to-toe -to -toe with an unknown number of MiGs, potentially as many as 16. Now, cutting over to Ford flight, Chappie has a MiG on his tail and he has no idea because his radio is malfunctioning and he can't hear his wingman telling him, hey, you have an enemy on your tail. So his wingman does the only thing he can think of. He handles it by himself. Bear in mind, it is Chappie, the MiG, and then his teammate. So his teammate oh. can't fire any missiles because he can't risk that He's missile back, accidentally Chappie. locking onto Chappie. So he has to perform another vector roll. He noses up, does a corkscrew, backflips. That is and that amazing. puts him at 90 degrees from where he was previously. So now he's coming this this way towards the enemy Ooh. and he fires heat seeking missiles and blows up the MiG-21 behind Chappie wow. Chappie even knowing that it happened. Chappie then immediately engages two MiGs that are directly in front of him and while that's going on cutting back over to Olds his wingman informs him that hey his secondary fuel tank isn't feeding fuel for some reason so he's already low on fuel. They are five minutes into this dogfight and Robin Olds makes the call that he is going to escort his wingman out of the target area and back to the airfield which is yet again another phenomenal display of leadership he could have ordered somebody else to do it so he could have stayed in the fight and soaked up more kills and padded his stats but no he did it himself for wow. the next eight minutes the remaining 10 f4s engage every mig 21 they can find until they have either been blown up or have disappeared and are hiding in the clouds so at this point the f4s call it a day they head back to base the other four flights of f4s didn't even make it to the target zone in time so only 12 of the 28 f4s in the air actually engage the air. and they did As the, the lot start showing up and they start landing the ground crews are there waiting with anticipation to find out how it went I mean, this is one of the coolest missions ever done. Yeah. Probably the coolest thing a lot of these guys are ever going to be involved with. So they're super pumped to hear how it went. As the F4 canopies open up, the pilots start holding up fingers of ones and twos, telling everybody how many MiGs they shot down. And the oh, entire wow. place turns into an enormous party. Wow. They're celebrating. All these guys are just absolutely pumped that they shot down a bunch of MiG-21s. So they debrief, trying to figure out everything that happened in this 13 minutes of absolute chaos. And first and foremost, the best news, not a single American pilot got shot down. Wow. Then they figure out that they for sure shot down seven MiG-21s with an additional two probable for a total of as many as nine. And bear in mind that the North Vietnamese only had somewhere between 14, 12 16, yeah. and 16 to begin with. So at worst, Operation Bolo has effectively destroyed at least half of North Vietnam's MiG-21 fleet. Wow. Okay, and there's always going to be that one guy in the comment section like, Buh, I can't believe you made an entire video about them only shooting down seven aircrafts. Buh. Okay, first of all, this isn't a video game. This is real life. And going seven it's and very hard. here aircrafts is absolutely incredible. Secondly, in a way, Operation Bolo didn't just destroy half of the enemy MiG-21 fleet, it also destroyed their entire fleet's operational capability, mm. and that is because now, they can't make a mistake like that again, because they've lost half of their fucking planes. If they do that, they won't have any. In addition to that, now, they have no way of knowing if it's actually a bunch of F-105s are getting mm. sent up to fight, or if it's another trap. So now, the remaining MiG-21s are going to be infinitely now more mind is also playing with them. used, which is going to save countless F-105s in the long run. Robin is a crazy man because we saw what happened in this whole story like how they just like were able to defeat every like half of the Vietnam's uh, fleet and also like the thing that was most astounding was like how politicians were constantly breaking them and if it would have been just American army then they would have done it very easily much much before but it was continuously politicians throwing things at them that you have to do this and that mm. and this and that and they were still trying to but match still it. they did that. Yeah. Most important the weather even in such kind of stormy weather they still fought in such a you know fear 
worst way actually and the thing was it was also the weather and also the things that were happening and also like they were they planned 28 planes but did 28 planes did not arrive when it was just 10 to 14 planes that mm. were there but they still did it and mm. they were like they got most of the planes so it was very very big thing for them and i think so this is something that just shows that uh, american courage and american fleet is something very different like because they got the big lesson that never ever mess with america hmm, even even uh, like vietnamese people had a very good plan still they defeated them so what do you guys think about it do let us know in the comment section below so do like share and subscribe bye, bye.